All right, grab your Bibles. If you're out there, grab your Bibles. If you're in here, um, and then make sure that you've got your Bible. And this week, uh, as, as things began to unfold, I, I wasn't quite sure, should I do the same message? Should I do a different message? I, I, I was sure of one thing. I wanted to, to be more upbeat and positive. I wanted to share something encouraging. Uh, number one, the last couple of weeks in James, uh, James has been kind of tough on us. He's been talking about us controlling our tongues, but that that's impossible. He's talked about us uh, dealing with our jealousy and our selfish ambition, but then telling us it's almost impossible to do that. Last week, he talked about how that, that personal stuff, our jealousy and our selfish ambition, can infect uh, the, the wider community, the church at large, cause quarrels and fights among us. And he, he even started doing some name calling last week, calling us adulterers and murderers, and, but ultimately challenging us to submit to God and to take all of this very seriously. But all of that has been kind of, kind of a downer. And then with everything going on this week, uh, I wanted to do something more uplifting and encouraging, and, and I, I'm determined to do that this morning. And, and that was my plan. And, and again, I was trying to decide, do I stay, do we stay in James? And I will tell you, we are going to stay in James, even though when you begin to hear, um, we're going to be in James chapter 4, starting in verse 11. When you see the things that James is talking about this morning, uh, at first it doesn't seem very encouraging. In fact, it seems very discouraging. Uh, but I want to tell you that I'm going to hold to this promise that we're, you got to hang with me a little bit. And as we get to the end, it, it will be encouraging. James this morning gives us three warnings, three things that he's, he, he's telling us that we need to be careful of. And, and they seem harmless at first. It's don't judge, uh, don't make plans. And he gives a warning to the rich. And we're going to dive into those a little bit deeper. But as we do get into these, in, J in typical James fashion, he does not hold any punches. He just, he, he speaks what he believes. He is hard. He is harsh. Um, and it comes out of, this section comes out of the passage uh, in, in James chapter, the early part of James chapter 4, where he's telling us that we have to make a choice between the world and God. Are we going to do things the world's way? Are we going to be friends with the world? Are we going to do things God's way and be friends with God? So out of all of that come these warnings of what not to do. But again, I want you to hang with me. We're going to talk through uh, these things, these warnings that James gives us, the things that he's telling us not to do, and we're going to get to the good news. All right, so let's start with number one, warnings against judging others. He gives us that first warning. Number Warning number one is don't judge people. Uh, let's read it, verse 11. Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you are criticizing and judging God's law. But your job, I got to stand, is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone, who gave the law, is the judge. He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor. Now, obviously, this section is all about judging one another. And it, it's straightforward. Don't judge people. And why does he say not to judge people? He makes it very clear because that's not your job. It's God's job. So what does he say is our job? He tells us our job is to obey the law. He says, if you criticize God's people and judge each other, then you're criticizing and judging God's law. But your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it decides to, whether it applies to you. Which brings us back to this whole world versus Jesus thing. The world tells us we need to put people in their place. Um, it, the world tells us we need to keep people in line, make sure people are following the rules. In fact, we have entire uh, organizations created around making sure that people are following the rules. We love telling people what to do. Is that right? Do we like telling people what to do? We love telling people what to do. But we don't want somebody telling us what to do, which is a little bit ironic. Uh, and, and that becomes apparent when you get behind the wheel. Anyone ever been, uh, we, we have a name for them. Someone, while you're driving and someone is telling you how to drive, what do we call them? All right, they're backseat drivers. And so when, when we're in a car, 
and we're driving, we don't want someone else telling us what to do. But when we are sitting in that other chair, we're very sure we're making sure to tell people exactly how to drive, right? In fact, some of you in that other seat may have your own brake on that side of the car. We love telling people what to do, but we don't want people to tell us what to do. But the world says it's our job to keep people in line. But Jesus doesn't say that. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to be going back into Matthew quite a bit because a lot of what James teaches here connects right back to Matthew. Matthew 7, uh, starting in verse 1, says, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see the past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Jesus tells us it is not our job, it is not our responsibility to judge other people. So James is just reflecting what Jesus says. Jesus says, do not judge others, and James repeats that warning, don't judge other people. So the command here is the warning is very clear, don't judge people. That one's very simple and it's very straightforward, but James doesn't finish there. He goes goes on. And warning number two starts in verse 13. He says, look here, you who say today or tomorrow we're going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own plans, and all such boasting is evil. Remember, it is sin to know what you ought to do and then to not do it. James here is talking about, the, the, he's warning us against making plans. In fact, he tells us, don't make plans without God involved in them. And, and that seems to fly in the face of conventional wisdom, doesn't it? The world tells us you need to make plans. You need to, in fact, there's a phrase, if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. Fail to plan, plan to fail. We need to plan ahead in order to get ahead. Now, is James saying, am I saying, are we saying that planning is wrong or bad? No. It's, it's what we're planning In this case, they were planning. It was all about business. Today or tomorrow, we're going to go to a certain town, and we're going to do business there, and we're going to make a profit. So it's about what we're planning and how we're planning. Is God involved in that, or is he not involved in that? Because he says, what you ought to do is say, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or do that. We've got to be careful about making plans, and this is very appropriate. And the reason I decided to continue to move forward in this section is because in the, in the times that we're living in, um, people are making plans. They're doing things, but they're not necessarily bringing God into those conversations. And it's because of this uncertainty and fear that we have. And we're judging people. How many of you are judging people because of all the toilet paper that they're going and and buying, right? Yeah, you can't see, but every hand here is raised, and I'm sure every hand there is raised. We're judging people because we need that toilet paper. And how can you how can you go take all of that? Save some for the rest of us, right? And we're but we're also trying to make plans. And, and our lives are turned upside down right now because we don't know what plans to make. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen next week? We're just not sure. We're not sure what to do. And what James says is is the warning is against making plans and not involving God in those plans. We need to be asking God what His plan is. And again, back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 19. While I get there. Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. We're going to jump a little bit. This is straight from the Sermon on the Mount, which is where much of what James talks about comes from. Jesus says, Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there is the desire, there the desires of your heart will be. And then jump down to verse 31. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear, or where am I going to get my toilet paper? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. 
Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. Jesus tells us we need to make sure we're putting our hope and our treasure and our plans into God's hands, that we're building his kingdom, not our kingdom, that we're not worrying about money or focusing on the the temporary things, but we're focusing on the bigger things. We're bringing God into our plans and we're seeking his kingdom. So the first thing James tells us is don't judge people. And then he tells us don't make plans without God. And then he gets very direct and he, he, has a, he issues a warning directly to rich people, which I know some of you were saying, well, thank goodness I don't have to listen to this part of it. But listen to the overarching theme of what he's saying, starting in uh, James 5, starting in verse 1. Look here, you rich people, weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver have become worthless. The very wealth that you were counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This treasure you have accumulated will stand as evidence against you on the day of judgment. So that first part, he's talking to the rich and saying, you put your hope and your trust in your treasure, in your wealth, in your gold and in your silver, but there's coming a time when all of that is going to be worthless. There will either come a time in our society when it becomes worthless or there's going to come a time in your life when it becomes worthless because you can't take it with you. But he doesn't finish there. It's not just about the money. He he also talks about the ways that people who have money often treat people. Verse 4, for listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated out of their pay. The wages you held back cry out against you. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. He says, look, the rich people, you have taken the, the, the money that you have, And you have used it on yourself and on your own pleasure. And and the flip side of that is you've treated people poorly. You've cheated them out of their play. You've condemned them. You've even killed innocent people by by your actions. And the world says that's okay. The world says he who dies with the most toys wins and do whatever it takes to get away, get ahead. But Jesus has a whole different way of thinking. Matthew, back to Matthew chapter 6. Hopefully you kept your finger in there like I didn't. Matthew 6.24 says, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And then if you jump to 7 verse 12, is the golden rule, Do to others what you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. We can't serve both God and money. You can't serve the world and serve God. And our, our, our task is ultimately uh, not to focus our heart and energy on those things. So James, again, gives us three warnings. Don't judge other people. Don't make plans without God. And be careful if you've got money. Be careful how you treat people. And, and more than just warnings, they're directives to us. But again, and and as I was reading this and and I'd made the commitment that we're going to be more positive and this is going to be uplifting, so far has that been very positive and uplifting? (laughs) No. So the real question is, where's the good news? How are we going to spin this or, or not just spin it, I don't want to just put spin on it, but how are we going to turn this around and find the good news, something that is uplifting, something that encourages us and builds us up. And I racked my brain this week before even a lot of this stuff happened at the end of the week, and, and, and God, it, it hit me. God showed, us very, showed me very clearly that all of this really is good news. Because here's the good news. As James is telling us that we aren't supposed to judge one another, we shouldn't make plans, and we've got to be careful with our money, the good news is, is that we don't have to do any of these things. We don't need to judge. We don't need to make plans without God. We don't need to treat people poorly or, or serve money or, or hoard our resources. And the why that we don't need to do them is the important thing. Why don't we need to judge people? Why don't we need to make plans without him? Why don't we need to hoard our resources and treat people poorly? The answer is very simple. It's not our job. 
It's not our job to judge people. It's not our job even to, to think about the future too far down the road. It's not our job to treat people poorly. What is, or whose job is it to judge people? He even tells us, whose job is that? God's. And God is really good at his job. God knows things about people that we don't know. Who's, who, who should we go to when we're looking to make plans? God. Why? Because he knows everything. He knows things that we don't know. He, 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 James is really saying, you don't need to do these things because that's God's job and he's good at your job, his job. What I want you to do is for you to do your job, which is becomes the really good news and, become, and, and brings us to the really important thing. He's saying, stop doing God's job and you start doing your job. So the question is, what is our job? Now, James doesn't tell us in this section what our job is, but we know what our job is. What's our job? To love people. Our job is very simply, very clearly to love people. One, one more time, back to Matthew 22. Well, it, I can't say it's the last time. Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus has been asked a question. What is the most important commandment? We've heard this before. We've talked about this before. And he says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. Our job is to love God and to love people. Very specifically, to love our neighbor. We've been given that challenge, haven't we? To love our neighbor, to pray for our neighbor, to care for them, to reach out to them, to invite them, to, to love on them, to introduce ourselves to them. And James is telling us we shouldn't judge people. Instead of judging them, what should we do? We should love them. Instead of building our kingdom, or instead of building our kingdom and making our own plans, whose kingdom should we be seeking? God's. And we should be making plans to build God's kingdom. And we shouldn't hurt people. We should be supporting people and encouraging them. And as I, as I began to think about what James is really telling us is, it's not just a stop doing that. He's saying there's no reason for you to be doing that because that's not where your heart, that's not where your energy should be. You should not be judging people. You should not be, in fact, can, can we even say that we shouldn't be judging people for buying all the toilet paper? That's a tough one, right? But, but they took all of the toilet paper and, and I need some toilet paper. How can I not judge them or criticize them for that? James says, that's not your job. That is God's job. What we should be doing is finding people in our community who might need that toilet paper and doing everything we can to make sure that they, they, that they have it. And as I thought through this, even this morning, I thought, how, how can we make this more practical this morning? Because we're sitting at home, we're doing something completely different you know, I'm speaking to a pretty much empty, empty room, except for the fabulous people here. You're sitting at home. You're sitting with your family. You're not, kids are not going to school. Schools have been delayed. We have no idea when life is getting back to normal. The NBA is shut down. They're, every morning, every day you get up and something new seems to be postponed. And there's this sense of uncertainty and fear that is gripping people. In fact, why are people buying all the toilet paper? What is that about? They're scared. They're terrified. They have no idea what the future holds. And when the future becomes uncertain, we, we get scared. And fear begins to set in. And that's one of the reasons we don't, shouldn't be judging people. Because we don't understand what's going on in their heart and in their life. Or actually, we can understand it. And we're responding out of our own fear and out of our own um, uncertainty for what tomorrow holds. So as I began to think about that and think about what should we be talking about this morning, should I even, again, go through James, but I think it gives us a perfect segue into what's going on in our world right now, what's happening in our lives and in our homes. And we have healthcare workers that are struggling and trying to figure out how do we, how do we meet the need, the demand, and, and continue to keep ourselves safe and our families safe in the midst of everything that's going on. So this morning I was, I was thinking and praying and, and I got the answer. I got something more practical and, and I got to be honest, it didn't come from me. I sat down to start writing something and I actually went to Instagram and Craig Groeschel, 
who's a much more well-known pastor than I am, had a post on Instagram that spoke directly. Not only here we're be giving three warnings, right? Don't judge. Don't make plans without God. Be careful how you're taking care of people and using your resources. Those are the three warnings. But I want to talk about how do we respond. The, 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 the counter to those three warnings is, and what Craig Rochelle shared was three ways that we can battle our fear. Three ways to battle the uncertainty of the unknown that's coming down the road. How do we, as Christians, as, as Christ followers, how do we respond when things become uncertain? We, we shouldn't respond by judging people. We shouldn't respond by saying, well, I'm just going to make better plans. We certainly shouldn't respond by saying, well, if I've got something, I'm going to hoard it and I'm not going to let anybody else have it. James is saying that's not how we respond. How do we respond? And I want to give three ways. And again, these are not mine. They're from Craig Groeschel. But to be fair, they're not from him either. They're actually straight out of Scripture. Number one is we live by faith. We don't live in fear. Live by faith, not in fear. Again, go back to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 27. And Jesus is speaking, and he says, I am leaving you with a gift. This is right before he was about to be crucified. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. What gift did Jesus give us? Peace of mind. Regardless of what's going on, regardless of how uncertain the future is, and he was speaking to his disciples before their world was about to really get turned upside down, before everything was about to change for them. Every, every out bit of security that they had in their lives, everything they thought about the world, everything they believed was about to get turned upside down. And Jesus says, look, I'm, I'm leaving you with this gift, peace of mind and heart, and the world cannot give you this. You cannot find this kind of peace in the world. It only comes from me. So don't be troubled or afraid. We as Christians need to live by faith not by fear. And the very definition of faith, you look in, in Hebrews, it's, the, it's believing in things that you can't see, that you don't understand, that you can't even begin to fathom. And there, there's a future in front of us. We thought we knew how the world worked. We thought we knew what next week was going to be like. And that has changed. But God says we Christians are uniquely qualified because faith says, I believe in God, not in the government. I believe in God, not in the stock market. I believe in God, not in our grocery stores. I believe in God, not in Amazon. I believe in God even for the things I cannot see. So we live by faith, not by fear. And, and, and when we're uncertain and we're unsure, we come back to the, not, not, not what God is doing, but who God ultimately is. And he says, I've got you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am here through the, through the worst of times and in the, in the best of times. So number one, we live by faith, not in fear. Number two, and James talks about this, be sacrificial, not selfish. Be sacrificial, not selfish. And, and that's really what's driving a lot of what's going on in our culture and in our world today. People are responding in from their fear and saying, I need to make sure that I get mine. When what God calls us to is to, is to not be selfish, but to be sacrificial and look out for the interest of others. Philippians 2, 3 through 4 says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble thinking of others as better than yourselves, and don't look only to your own interest, but take an interest in others too. And I think in these times that is so important that we see the needs of others around us and we take an interest in them, that we're not only looking out for ourselves, but we're looking out for one another. And I know that we as a church body are doing that. I heard we had our food pantry this week, and even those who were coming to get food were asking can I go deliver food to somebody? And if you know somebody who's in isolation or is in quarantine or is in that risk, at risk group that they're asking to stay home at the 70 and above or they have respiratory problems or underlying health issues, find a way to help them. Find a way to think about ways that you can bring groceries to them. Or if we have health workers and you think about health workers who now their kids, we have no idea when their kids are going back to school. How can we help them? We need them. I, I can't go work at the hospital, but I can probably watch some kids. You may not be able to go, go to the hospital and, and give uh, 
take care of somebody there, but you can maybe take care of the kids of those healthcare workers. We can be creative and think, when we stop thinking about what I need and we start thinking about what others need and we take care of one another, then there's going to be plenty of toilet paper to go around. There's going to be plenty of everything because we're going to share and we're going to take care of one another and, and we're going to be there for one another. So live by faith, not in fear. Be sacrificial, not selfish. And number three, we need to shine the light, not hide it. Last time into Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, starting in verse 14. Actually, let's go back to 13. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world. We are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. We as individuals and we as a church have the light of Jesus Christ. We have the faith. We have the hope. We can demonstrate what it means to care and sacrifice for one another. And we got to make sure that our light is shining, that the light of Jesus is shining out into this dark world in these dark times. Now, I know that's hard when we say, but I thought I was supposed to stay home. Well, you're supposed to stay home and not come to a big, large gathering, but that doesn't mean you can't make sure that your neighbor is okay or members of your family are okay or people in your neighborhood are okay. We need to make sure during this time that we're not hiding the light or hoarding the light, but we're shining and sharing that light. And again, this is our job. It's not our job to, to judge people or criticize them. It's not our job to make sure that we're okay without worrying about everyone else. Our job is to love, to have faith, to sacrifice, and to be the light. So here's the challenge, is we need to go do our job. We need to do the job that God has called us to. And, and, and when we do our job, no matter what's going on out in the world, and we have examples of this throughout history, this is not the first and it will not be the last crisis that we are faced with. You think about 9-11, and I remember people thinking at 9-11 that nothing, the world was never going to be the same, and it, it hasn't been the same, but we're all still here and we're all still holding tough. This is not the first health crisis we've faced. In these times of crisis, when things are unprecedented and we have a room full, empty full of people, but we, have, we are so thankful we have technology that we can still stay connected. And I want to encourage you to find ways to be connected and love one another and care for one another. Let's go do our job. Let's go do the job that God has given us to live in faith and to demonstrate that faith to people who don't have that faith. And, say, and you can say, look, I'm scared, I am uncertain, I don't know what's coming next week, but here's what I do know. God is in control and he promises that he's going to take care of us. And what he's asking me to do is sacrifice for you, to love on you, to care for you, to make sure that your needs are met, and I want to be the light of Jesus Christ. So let's go do our job. Let's pray. Father, I am so thankful that even during these trying, difficult, uncertain times, that we still have one another. And even if we can't gather in a room together, we can still gather together. We have the technology and we have the resources to make that happen. And I am so thankful for that. Father, I want to right now pray for those. Uh, first, those healthcare workers who are on the front lines, who are facing and taking the brunt of, uh, really the brunt of this challenge that we have. And I pray that you would encourage them and strengthen them and give them the perseverance every day to go into work and, and to do the good work that you've put in front of them. I pray for those who are affected directly by, this, by the coronavirus and by many other diseases, by many other health challenges, that you'd uh, alleviate their fears and give them a sense of peace and calm and hope in the midst of uncertainty and in the midst of an uncertain future. Father, I pray that you bring health uh, to, to not only this, this region, not only to our community, but to our nation and, and around the world. 
I pray for countries that have been hit the hardest, for China and for Italy and for South Korea. And as others uh, continue to, in, in our nation, this, the centers that have been hit the hardest, I'm thinking of New York and Seattle. And, and every day we wake up and seem to hear, we hear that there are more and more cases. But Father, we are determined to live in faith, not in fear. We are determined to share the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to make sacri- a, a sacrifice of love for the people around us. And Father, you know that there are those um, that at home and those even here in this room whose businesses, whose livelihood are, are put at risk because of the changes that are, that are occurring and the, the changes in our, in our financial sector and people just not, not going out, not venturing out, and, and life just begins to change. And I pray that you'll help us through these times. Father, I am so thankful for a church that is so generous and loving and caring who's going to take this this challenge to heart, that we will do our job to love on and care for the people around us. And we we ask all of these things in, in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. Hey, have a great afternoon. Have a great day. Uh, Love on some people around you. Reach out to somebody. Go love somebody today. God bless. Have a great rest of your day.